During the last episode, we spent some time talking about the dangers and issues that are involved with our Who Is records and the information that's being displayed there, and talked about some of the things we'd want to val validate as a either security person or maybe as an auditor, questions to ask while we're there. We also took a quick look at this uh, mapper tool that I mentioned to you the last time and gave you a reference in the link in the show notes to show you where you could download this tool. Though I have a slightly different version of the tool here that I'd like to use to expand on our discussion from last week and finish that discussion with the ultimate defense that you need to do. Not only do you need to make sure that you don't have personal information that could be used for social engineering, perhaps, in your domain records, not only do you want to make sure that your DNS servers are things that you actually own, you'd also like to control what information your DNS servers have available. So here in a test environment, I've got a DNS server running at the IP address 128.226.1.2. And that DNS server is authoritative for the EnclaveForensics.com domain. Now, we showed the last time how we could use this mapper tool to have it go through a series of addresses. Let's just pick some addresses here. I'll have it go from 1.0 through 128.226.2.255. And I would normally not have to have the ability to do this with the script, but in my environment here, I've actually got a slightly different version of the script that allows me to also specify the name server to query. Now this is where it gets really interesting. If I just run that script, you can see here that it reports the information for me about the public addresses that are available. And we understand from last week's discussion that if we were using public addressing on the inside, for instance, this 128.226 is actually a class B, that this information could potentially reveal internal addressing. However, many, many organizations are beginning to use private addressing or have been using private addressing on the inside of the network. Sometimes they've done this just because they didn't have a lot of IP address space allocated. Sometimes it's because there's a standard requiring it, like the PCI standard. Either way, using private addressing is a very smart thing to do. However, there's still a danger. Let me do a scan here for 192.168.0.0 through 192.168.2.255, and I'm going to run the same query against that same DNS server. Now, be clear here that uh, using this on the internet is not going to give you any good results, because the version of the script that I release doesn't allow you to specify the DNS server to query. Though making that change is not that hard, and if you'd like to contact me directly, perhaps, I'd be happy to help you out with it, maybe even consider releasing this version of the script. But if I target a DNS server on the internet, with its actual IP address here, and then ask it to do the reverse query, notice what happens now. Now I'm finding that internally addressed systems, 192, 168.1.1, 2.10, 2.12, 2.13, .2 all of these are now returning information to me that normally I would never be able to see from the internet. Now it's true that some people discuss or, or question how much value is there really in hiding this information because so what you can see what my internal addressing space is. Well any information that we reveal is really an exposure for us. We've just made an attacker's job that much easier should the attacker be able to compromise one of our machines and now begin to pivot toward internal systems. In fact because we've got this naming information available on the internet now they even maybe are able to select the systems they want to pivot to without having to do any internal scanning. So this actually is quite dangerous. Of course, having misconfigurations on our firewall, perhaps dealing with things like source routing attacks and things like that, again with misconfigurations, can lead to even more direct exposures. So what's the, uh, what's the fix for this? Well, the fix that you'd like to take a look at in your environment, you'd like to make sure that you're using, at a minimum, what's called a split DNS arrangement. Now, we take a lot of time to explain exactly how that works in our Audit 507 class, but I'll just give it to you briefly here. It means that we're going to take the DNS zone information, in this case, the EnclaveForensics.com zone, and we're going to split the zone. 
That means that the public DNS server that faces the Internet will only have information about public servers, while the internal DNS server will have information about internal hosts and potentially external hosts too. Now that would lead to some duplication, but it's, so it's really not necessary. What you'd really prefer to do is have the internal server forward any external requests, for instance, for your own public web server, to the external DNS server as well. So in this way, by splitting the zone records, even if someone were to query your public DNS server, the internal record information simply is not accessible. So that's the ultimate solution. Of course, there are other things that can go wrong in DNS, but for now, we're just going to have a short episode this week, and next week, we're going to take a look at maybe some more scripting aspects, especially when it comes to using PowerShell for getting more information from your, your uh, Active Directory. Thanks for listening.